Hey guys, Mr. Smith here, shooting a video lesson on Hooke's Law and spring energy, or in other words, elastic potential energy. So it is Friday afternoon and I'm pretty gassed. So we'll see how this lesson goes. Um, hopefully not too bad. I'm gonna try to squeeze it in before I give, give, it a, give it a rest for the day. So I think we'd all agree that if you take a spring and you put a force on it, then the, the spring will either stretch or compress, depending on which way you press, you, you push or pull. Um, what we'd like to do today is kind of figure out what, what is the relationship between the force you apply to a spring and how far it stretches or compresses. And also, you know, I think we all agree too, like if you've ever taken an elastic and fired it at your friend as a bit of a joke, that when you stretch that elastic, you're actually storing energy in it. And when you release the elastic, it flies off and hurts your friend, right? Um, same thing with a click pen. Like we've all have experiences storing energy in, uh, in springs. And like, we'd like to also quantify today, you know, how much energy is stored in a spring based on how much you can press or stretch it. So we're going to find that, that out today. So to, to start off, I have a FET simulation. The QR code is there if you want to snap it, um, or you, the links on the classroom or on Brightspace. Um, and, uh, when you go into it, you can play around the intro to see how it works, like clicking with your mouse and putting masses on springs, et cetera. But then ultimately you want to be in the lab option. And I just want to say too, like teach, be, teach, taking this course online, like we just can't really do a lot of physical labs because we're not together. We don't have a lot of equipment, right? So these simulations are like a chance for you to, to discover some things on your own and that's not take everything from me and just all theory, theory, theory. It's a chance for you to play around with things a little bit. So I have, uh, asked you to play around for a few minutes. And then when you get to the lab, uh, this is important. I'll show you guys, make sure damping is set to lots and then hang the hundred gram, gram weight on the spring and see what happens. So uh, I'm gonna pull up the, yeah, here's the applet. So make sure damping is on lots and make sure you're in the lab. Um, so, cause if you have damping on none and you hang a mass on it, the spring, it's gonna bob up and down forever because damping is kind of like friction. If there's no friction, it's just gonna go on forever. But what we'd like to, we'd like to investigate, you know, depending on the mass we hang on, what's the, what's the stretch like? So you can do that with a hundred kilogram and then you're gonna double to 200 and see what happens. And I've got a ruler here to kind of just roughly measure that out. And again, you're not, you don't have to take notes for anything, just observations. You're gonna do half the mass. You're gonna change this something called spring constant and see how that changes things. Uh, and then if you're finished and you think you have a good idea about how force on the spring affects the stretch on the spring, then you can add in, maybe change the damping down to none again and add in the velocity acceleration vectors. So when you release and you see the motion of a spring bobbing up and down, what direction the force and acceleration's in and look at what direction the velocity is in. And there's a definite pattern there. Can you reason what that pattern is? This motion is something called simple harmonic motion. And it's actually what we'll talk about in our next lesson. So let me just let that hang there. Um, I may come back to this uh, applet to talk about a few things as I do the lesson. Um, but yeah, let's, so pause the video and play around with it. And then you can unpause when you're ready to keep moving forward. Um, so I'll assume you've tried it. We're unpaused. Here we go. Hooke's law relates the amount of stretch or compression to the amount of force applied on a spring. So hopefully what you noticed was that when you doubled the mass on the spring, you doubled the stretch in the spring. And if you have the mass, you have the stretch. And this is Hooke's law. And it's Hooke's law for an ideal spring. An ideal spring is a spring that never gets stretched or like deformed. I mean, you know, everyone has a has seen that slinky before, but after a while, kids play on the slinkies, they get kind of damaged a bit and they don't behave perfectly. And we all know, like you can't stretch a spring indefinitely, right? Eventually you stretch a spring, it's going to kind of break or, or compress it too hard. It's going to break. Um, but an ideal spring is like, assumes it doesn't deform. You can stretch it as long as you want, compress it as long as you want. Um, so we assume Hooke's law for ideal springs. Um, 
Mathematically, what does Hooke's Law look like? Well, it looks like this. So first, I'm going to get this down. So this is the force exerted by a spring is equal to negative k and then vector x. So first off, this fs is the force exerted by the spring. And I want to add too, why the negative? The negative indicates that this force exerted by the spring is a restoring force. Because think about it. If I take a spring, like even the one I have on the this diagram here, if I pull this mass or pull the spring to the right, which way is the spring going to exert a force in the mass? It's going to pull it left, right? And if I compress, if I compress the spring to the left, the spring's going to push back. So the force exerted by the spring is always opposite the stretch. Now, often we will just kind of be concerned with the magnitude of the spring force. And so sometimes and often I prefer just to use Hooke's law in this way. The force of a spring is just K times X. This value of K is this proportionality constant. It's units are newtons per, per meter. It's called the sp spring constant and it's always positive, but it varies from spring to spring. So note the, notice the units of newtons per meter. It just basically tells you how many newtons you need to get a stretch of one meter. And a higher spring constant means your elastic object is stiffer. So a, a bigger K means your you, you, it takes more force to stretch or compress your spring. And a really low K means your spring is very loose and it's easy to stretch. So the larger value of K, more difficult to stretch. So big K would be like the shocks and suspension in a car. Like have you seen those springs? They're very thick. They're like, an, like they maybe half an inch thick or bigger. I'm not a car guy, but they're really big. But if you've ever, most of us have taken apart a mechanical mechanical pen. You ever seen the spring in one of those guys? They're very, very, very small. And those springs would have a very small spring constant. I think I have everything I want to there. Yep. Uh, very quickly, factors that, if, let's talk about some factors that affect spring constant. So obviously like the material it's made of. Uh, you can make coils that are really thick. And you can change like the number of coils. Like you can make the spring wound tighter and tighter. And there's lots of other factors too, but lots of factors affect spring constant. And K is different for all any, any spring. Uh, graphically, here's two springs and a graph showing the force exerted by the spring for the amount of stretch or compression. And really it's not too important here, whether it's a stretch or compression. Um, just think of this as the magnitude of the force. Um, but here's two springs, one with spring constant K1, one with spring constant K2. Can you think of which spring here is the stiffer spring? Which one is harder to compress? Which one is easier to compress? You want to pause the video think about that and pause when you're ready if you said that this guy is the stiffer spring you'd be right because to get the same stretch of whatever that is 0.34 meters you have to apply like around 180 newton force to the spring k2 but only like 100 newton force to the spring k1 so that is stiffer and this guy's a more lighter spring and we can actually, um, do I have a note on this? No, I'll have to write it in. Actually find the spring constant. Remember slope, the uh, spring constant is in Newtons per meter. And if you found the slope of this line, the rise is Newtons and the run is meters. So the slope of this FX curve gives the spring constant. So you should get that down, that's important. 
And I think we could find, let's do for K2, we can do this. For spring two. So we would take, I don't think I need to write that in. We can just do the slope. So pick any points. I mean, obviously zero, zero makes a lot of sense. And obviously if you don't stretch a spring at all, if you don't exert a force on a spring, it's not gonna stretch or compress. But it looks like for K2, it looks like it takes 200 Newtons to stretch at 0.4 meters. And 200 divided by 0.4, I think is 500. Yeah, 500 Newtons per meter. So it would take 500 Newtons of force to stretch, stretch that spring um, one meter. And we can check for, I guess for K1, it's not, that's not hard to do either. It looks like, I don't know, 100 Newtons ish to stretch it 0.4 meters, uh, 0.4 meters. And so that would be 250. But the big idea there, guys, is that the slope of an FX curve of a force stretch curve gives you the spring constant and steeper is stiffer. Okay, so we've talked about Hooke's law, quantifying the force on a spring or exerted by a spring, given how much you stretch or compress it. Um, and now we can actually talk about how much energy is stored in the spring too. And it's actually not that hard of a derivation. So uh, I'm actually gonna leave the space here for some work uh, later on. But to find the energy stored in a spring, we're gonna start off with the work energy theorem. So imagine taking a spring, stretching it to a point, and that's your final condition. So you've obviously, obviously stored some energy in that spring, but the, you know, initially the spring's at rest and it, at the end it's at rest. And all that work you've done, it hasn't increased the speed. It hasn't changed the gravitational potential energy. All that work you did has stored energy in the spring. So work equals the change in, I'm gonna say ES for spring energy. And so that's the work energy theorem. The change in that spring energy is equal to the work we've done on it to stretch it. And we also know that work is F delta D. So the work on that spring is the applied force you put on that spring times uh, delta D. And so that'll be kind of our starting point for this derivation. Uh, so uh, we're going to use the average force and the fact that that delta D is just the stretch of compression. And also use this. So when the spring, spring is, uh, is not stretched at all, the initial spring energy is zero. There's no energy stored in the spring, right? So that final spring energy Again, it's gonna be equal to F app delta D. And the average to go to our graph here. So we're looking for an average force. And so we have some initial force F1 and some final force F2. So this is gonna be the average force So F average is just F1 plus F2 divided by two. And I'm gonna use X for delta D. So I've just actually taken that change in potential energy equals F app delta D and subbed a few things in. ES1 is zero, so it's final spring energy, average force, and uh, the displacement. And F1 is zero because you know no stretch equals no force. And from Hooke's law, F2 equals K delta X or just KX. So here we get the following, we get ES or ES2 equals zero plus KX over two times X. And if you simplify it, you get an equation for spring energy. 
So spring energy, and it kind of looks familiar in structure to kinetic energy. You've got K, or you've got the over two, so that's one half, right? You've got K, and you have X times X. So it kind of parallels kinetic energy a little bit, right? Looks like a similar formula. This energy stored in the spring is a half times the spring constant times the square of the stretch of compression. Now, if I go back to the graph, um, you can also get the area or the this stored energy by finding the area underneath this curve. Uh, but that's kind of more of a calculus concept. Um, but and that's a concept of finding integrals, which not everybody has talked about, even for those who have taken calculus. Um, yeah, let's actually um, maybe find uh, the um, energy stored in this spring here, just for fun. So stored energy, stored spring energy is one half kx squared. And for us, we already found the spring constant for this guy. It was 500, right? We did that on the previous slide. And the stretch here is 0 0.4. So it's that 250 times 0.4 squared. So 40 joules of stored energy in the spring. And you'll notice if you find the area of this triangle, it's just a triangle with a height of 200, a base of 0.4, and divided by two. Well, that's 100 times 0.4, you get 40. So it's the same, it's the same answer. So big takeaway guys, this is how you can calculate the elastic potential energy or the stored energy in the spring. So pretty cool. Let's just play around with those formulas a bit and get used to them. So we have a student stretches a spring a distance of 15 millimeters by applying a force of 0.18 newtons and the student applies a force to the east. So let's determine the force constant of the spring. So our starting point is Hooke's law, F equals KX. So K equals F over X. And again, um, I might throw in the subscript S here, not necessary. But again, this version here is just magnitudes, not really worried about direction. And so the question says that a 0.18 Newton force stretches it by 15 millimeters. So that's 0 0.015 meters. So 0.18 divided by 0 0.015. So the spring constant for this guy is 12 newtons per meter. Let's talk about B. So the student exerts a for, applies a force of 0.18 newtons east on the spring. Can you figure out the force exerted by the spring on the student? If you want to think about that and pause the video, you can. And unpause when you're ready. If you said that the force exerted by the, the spring on the student is also 0.18 newtons, but to the west, you'd be right because they'd be a pair of action reaction forces. So there's really not a lot of work to do here. It would be 0.18 newtons, but to the west. Student pulls on the spring, the spring pulls back on the student, the same force but opposite direction. And what's the energy stored in the spring? One half kx squared. We now have the spring constant, so we can do this. 0 0.015 squared. So not much energy. Six times 0 0.015 squared. Pretty small. 0 0.00135 joules of energy stored in that spring. But just a simple problem, just kind of getting us used to using the formulas and doing some calculations. Uh, let's try a more involved problem. So here we have a mass of 0.75 kilograms. And just like you guys saw in the, um, the FET simulation, with lots of damping, if you hang a mass on a spring, the spring is gonna stretch down and find some kind of equilibrium. So that's why this question has said it stretched slowly from an unstretched position, it comes to a new equilibrium. That's just to say it's not bobbing up and down. It just was unstretched. We, hang on, we hung a mass on it 
And instead of bobbing up and down, we just lower it to that point where it just stays at rest. And the question says that that new position is 0.15 meters below the initial one. And so you've got a diagram of the actual system and a free body diagram too. Now, my personal preference, the Nelson text here uses negative KX. You know me, I just prefer to actually just use magnitudes. So I just use KX. And I understand that KX is the magnitude of the spring force. And I know the direction based on whether I'm compressing it or stretching it. So if you think about it in this one, it's obvious if the ball is hanging down and the spring is above it, the spring is pulling back upwards on the ball. So we're going to determine the force constant of the spring and then do a couple other things with that too. Um, so uh, let's begin. I think we can get them all on this one screen here. So if you look at the free body diagram, if the, um, for part A, this is when the ball is at rest. And if it's at rest, the sum of forces in our y direction are equal to zero. Because it's not accelerating up or down, it's at rest, right? Which means for part A, that the question has chosen down to be positive. So that mg minus kx is equal to zero. So obviously that obviously the if it's not moving, the spring force and the gravity force are perfectly balanced. And we can now find the spring constant because we know m and we know g and we know the stretch. So the mass from the problem, 0 0.075, 9.8, and the stretch, uh, 0.15 meters. And because we have kilograms, meters per second squared, and meters, we know that um, newtons per meter is going to pop out. Times 9.8 divided by 0.15. So I got a spring constant of 4.9 newtons per meter. I'm just going to check my work from earlier. I got the same thing. So now we're ready to do B. Now B is a bit different. So B, the ball is not at equilibrium anymore. The ball is now lifted back up to some earlier position and then dropped. So it's going to start falling down. And while it's falling down, this is what we're asked to do. While it's falling down, when the stretch is... 7.1 centimeters or 0 0.071 meters. So like when it's between here and here, what's the force on the spring? So the problem is uh, the uh, problem is still very similar. But here are some of forces in the y direction. It's not going to be zero. Um, our sum of forces is still the weight minus the spring force, but here it is parameters are different. So we have the same mass, 0 0.075, G is 9.8. We solve for the spring constant, 4.9, and here it's telling us to stretch is 0 0.071. Times 9.8 minus 4.9 times 0 0.071. Uh, so just double checking, yeah, I got the same answer as I got before, 0.39 newtons. And so that's the magnitude. And we've chosen down to be positive. So we do know that's down at that point. So the, the ball is still accelerating downwards at that point, um, which makes sense because it's going to pass that spot where it would normally be hanging. And then um, the spring force will be bigger than gravity, and it's going to want to pull it back up. I'm getting a bit into next the next topic's lesson, so I'm going to hold on there. And once we have the net force, we can find the acceleration. So the sum of forces in the y direction is mass and acceleration. So acceleration is that sum of forces divided by the mass. So 0.39 newtons down. What was the mass? 0 0.075. Oh, 5.2 meters per second squared. All right, so another example in the books, just kind of playing around 
with Newton's laws and adding in some, some spring force examples. Let's continue. So we're going to wrap up this lesson by tying spring energy into our conservation of energy problems. Because as we all know, you know, with an elastic, you can store some spring energy like a slingshot, right? You take a slingshot back and you store some spring energy. And when you let it go, that spring energy is converted into kinetic energy of whatever you're launching. Um, so, and you know, um, a bow and arrow, a guitar string, a pole vaulter, <clears throat> those aren't exactly springs, right? But with a bow and arrow, you pull back on the string, store some energy and fires, a fires an arrow. And a guitar string, you pluck a guitar string, you stretch it a little bit, and then it releases and it starts to move. And a pole vaulter, they bend the pole, and then that pole unbends and launches them up in the air. So those, even those things that don't exactly don't exactly look like springs, we can uh, think of them as springs and talk about them in terms of elastic potential energy. And that's actually why the more general term is elastic potential energy and not spring energy. Because in reality, the, the, the stuff we are doing works for anything that you can stretch or bend and store energy in. So uh, here's our first problem. So we have an apple attached to a vertical spring. We know the force constant this time. And we hold the apple so that the spring is at its, so it's like kind of natural unstretched equilibrium. So meaning like take the apple off and if you're hanging the spring, the spring would naturally just be hanging at this point. But when you add some mass to it, it's gonna stretch even more, right? So that's what's going on here. Um, so we're gonna ignore and often we'll do this is we'll pretend the spring doesn't have any mass. Um, um, and um, the, as the spring kind of moves to, if we kind of neglect its mass, then we can kind of neglect the kinetic energy of the spring as well. We're gonna find out how much spring energy, potential energy is stored in the spring when the apple has fallen 11 centimeters. We'll also find the speed. Okay, so I do have room on my next, so I think I'll try to fit A on this one and maybe do part B on the next slide as well. Because yeah, A doesn't take A doesn't take too much. So um, we're just asked what the elastic potential energy is. And that's one half kx squared. And we're actually given the force constant, 9.6. And the question prompts us when it's fallen 11 centimeters. So just be mindful that you know force constant, spring constants, and newtons per meter. You need your stretch or compression to be in meters as well. So 11 centimeters is 0.11 uh, meters. So let's check this out. 4.8 times 0.11 squared. So about 0 0.058 joules stored in the spring. Um, Let's do B. So that one we could have done earlier, but now let's do a conservation energy problem. So this one's pretty cool. So I I usually start off with just a statement E before equals E after. And um, now we have kind of three things to consider. With the problem involving a spring or some kind of um, elastic object, so we now have gravitational potential energy to consider kinetic energy to consider, but now we also have spring energy to consider. And then after we'll have some EG2 plus some EK2 plus some ES2. Now let's make a, um, let's make a few things simpler here. So to start off, when the app, right when the apple is released, is the apple moving at all? No, it's not, it's released from rest. So EK1, zero. Um, initially, when it's dropped, we're at the equilibrium unstretched position. If there's no stretch, what's the force or what's the stored energy in the spring? It's zero as well. And so initially, it's all gravitational potential energy. And where do you want to choose your, your, your H equals zero? I think for this question, it makes sense to choose, I'm going to choose H equals zero to be this stretched out position 
Um, and there's a nice reason why. So now when we get down to that position, if I set that to be h equals zero, at that spot, there will be no gravitational potential energy. We will have a speed though, and there will be some stretch on the spring. So let's sub in. So we have mgh1. equals one half mv2 squared plus one half uh, kx squared. And if we think about it, we know we know m, we know g, we know h1. So that's just the that's just the 11 centimeters. Again, we know m, we know k, and we know x. So we can solve for v2. So how how you want to solve for v2 is up to you. Um, I like to solve for as I've mentioned. I like just to solve for it first and I like to clear my fractions. Now, notice in this question that M is not in every term. So we can't just cancel the M's. The M's actually relevant for this question because there's no M in, K in 1 half KX squared. Um, so solving for V2, I'm gonna have two MGH1. I'm gonna subtract off KX squared. And maybe I should be saying kx2 squared. It's just good practice because maybe you're doing another question where there's some stretch before. I'll say kx, I'll say x2. So to get v2 by itself, subtract off kx squared, we'll be dividing by m. And that would give us v2 squared. So we'll need to square root. This is part b. Yeah, so let's just finish this off. Just a bit of calculation problem now. All right, so two, uh, the mass was 0 0.1 kilograms. G is 9.8. Initial height, 0 0.11 meters above equilibrium. Minus spring constant, 9.6. And we know the stretch is also 0 0.11 squared. All divided by 0 0.1. And let's see what we get. So 0 0.2 is 9.8 times 0.11 minus 9.6 times 0.11 squared divided by 0.1 and root that. So um, something slightly different. Oh, because the mass is points dividing by m and the mass is 0.1. Okay. Yeah, I just did. I actually. Used the wrong value earlier. So let's double check. I told you guys it's Friday. I'm gassed. Almost done this lesson. I think we have one more example. Then I can shut my brain off for a while. Minus 9.6 times 0.11 squared uh, divided by 0.1 and root. Okay, so I got about one pretty near one meter per second. It was like 0.997 meters per second. And before I got 0.95, when I divided by 0.11 instead, uh, mistakenly plugging in the X for M. So I think that's good. Um, let me know, um, send me an email if I've made a mistake, but I think that's all good. But yeah, we can now are going to be able to tie in elastic potential energy to our conservation of energy problems. We'll do one more. So we're gonna look at a crate sliding down a uh, ramp and this crate is going to slide down the ramp and encounter a spring. And this is gonna compress the spring till eventually that spring is compressed and everything comes to rest. And we're gonna neglect friction to this, for this question. And the question says the spring compresses a distance of 0.3 meters before it stops. And what we're interested in finding in this question is like, what's the distance down the ramp that this crate slides before stopping. So pretty fun question, not too heavy. Do you have another spot for this? No, so um, that's what happened before. So maybe I'm just gonna draw what happens after. So we'll have the ramp and we'll have the same spring, but now it's gonna be compressed and our block is going to be there. And um, height there, 
And we know that at this point, the spring is compressed, has a compression of 0.3 meters. So that's X2. And what we want to find is that distance that it slid down the ramp. So this question is going to have a change in height. So it will have some GPE involved. So my suggestion to you guys is let's use that final position. Let's use that as H0 because then we should be able to find how high it was originally, H1, and then we'll be able to figure out how far it slid down the ramp. So that'll kind of be our starting point. Uh, so I might set the problem up and then erase this diagram as I need more room. I think that'll be a good idea. So let's set up our conservation of energy. So E before equals E after. Or E initial equals E after. Whatever you want to do. The three things we now consider. Gravitational potential energy. Kinetic energy, spring energy. Now, if we think about this problem, initially the crate is at rest, and then when it comes on the spring and settles, it stops too and it's at rest. So actually in this question, for this initial condition, this final condition, the kinetic energy doesn't factor in. It's zero for both. Also, Initially, when the crate is at the top of the ramp, the spring is not stretched. There's no spring energy initially. Um, and our nice choice of H, H equals zero, when the, when the crate finally settles, its gravitational potential energy will also be zero as well. And I think, you know what? I think I can probably squeeze this in here. So uh, Mg uh, H1, that initial height, is equal to one half K times X2 squared, the final stretch on the spring. And we know all these things so we can find H1. Uh, so to get H1, we'll take K X2 squared divided by, we have the two and we'll divide by M and we'll divide by G. So what's that 890, 0.3 squared, over two, uh, the mass is 22 kilograms, and G 9.8. So what do we get? So let's, we're finding that change in vertical height, and we'll almost be done. So 890 times 0.3 squared divided by 44 divided by, uh, don't know why a squared, but a square on 9.8. I know why, it's because I'm extremely tired. And so um, for the height, I got about 0.19 meters, so 19 centimeters. Nice. And so uh, now we're ready to solve the problem and finish it off. So we, we've shown that the change in height is 19 centimeters. What we want to find is this distance traveled, maybe call it delta D. And the angle of inclination of the ramp we're going to use now because we're told that the angle of inclination of the ramp is 29 degrees. So we're just going to use some basic SOHCAHTOA here. So the sine of 29 degrees is that um, opposite side, that drop of 19 centimeters divided by the hypotenuse delta D. So delta D is 19 divided by sine 29. And that's going to tell us how far it slid. About 39 centimeters down the ramp. All right, guys, another example in the books. Uh, good job. We did a lot in that lesson. So, um, uh, I may have broken that up into too many lessons and if I was in person or for you guys online, I felt like it makes a difference whether you're doing three video lessons a day or four. So I try to keep it to three. So we did it quite a bit in that lesson. Um, uh, what are we doing next? So as you guys have see, as you guys saw, hopefully when you attach a mass to a spring and release it, it bobs up and down and up and down and up and down. That motion has a special name. It's called synchro harmonic motion. 
And we'll talk about what that is and see how we can analyze it using conservation of energy. So it won't be anything too, too crazy. A, few, a bit more conservation of energy should be fun. Looking forward to it. Um, all, right, all right, guys, uh, good job. Um, I'm signing off for now. I uh, hope you're staying well. Have a great day. We'll see you soon.